I think you're muted, Ola. I'm muted. Not anymore. Not anymore. Thanks, guys, <laughs> for for um, bearing with us, and um, welcome to the artist extravaganza. Um, I think that I um, told you that we're in massive experiment mode, and um, I think this is going to be the biggest experiment of all of them. Um, we're going to have to kind of operate on, on the honor system. Uh, some people paid a little bit extra to like participate, and the rest of you can watch. So I asked um, everyone that had paid to, to put a star in front of their name um, so we could identify them easily. And I know a few of you have. And my idea here is that um, if you're all up for it, we can do like a speed dating thing. So I'm going to put two people on camera. The person on the left asks the person on the right a question. And then we get like a minute or, or two to respond. And then we can get through everyone in, in the allotted time and maybe hang out and, and yell on camera everyone uh, at the end. Sound OK? Sounds great. Sounds yeah. good. Awesome. So let me um, try and find someone. You're moving around. <laughs> Alan, I'm going to put you on spotlight. And you can ask Alan a question. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't even know what to say. Um, what can you play for us? <laughs> Repeat that. I, you cut out there on me. What can you play for us? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have to turn on my Apollo, uh, figure out what amp I'm going into. Um, plug in. Uh, I'm actually in the process right now. <clears throat> I'm getting ready to do my next solo record. And usually before I, I start recording anything that's heavy, I try to learn something that's incredibly difficult. And this time I chose Kill the Guy with the Ball from Steve I. Uh, nod to you, Mike. <laughs> I can only play it on I piano. Can... <laughs> it is, I, I can do it at 88% speed. But some parts are just so, so darn near impossible. Um, I'm seeing here. All right, yeah, yeah. Can you hear? Yeah, good enough. All right. Um, the hardest part of that song is that. <laughs> See? Yeah, it's just so darn difficult to play. You're cutting out as soon as you start playing. <laughs> There's a reason why Steve I is a guitar god. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We we had um, we had a good run. I am going to thank Alan and remove you from spotlight. And Alan, ask Mike something. You're on mute, Alan. Am I asking a question again? Alan, you're asking Mike a question. Okay, I follow. Um, let's stay on topic here with uh, Mr. Vi. Um, how how was it working with him? Is it like being dragged around by a horse? Um, uh, the 
the, the stock answer at this point for me is that it, it, they're the best guitar lessons I ever got paid to take. <laughs> um, because there, it really was an incredible discipline uh, having to get inside his playing style, every aspect, every nuance of his playing style, which is the only way it was going to work to play stuff in unison with him or in harmony with him or in octaves. Like the, the time we spent going over each phrase of, of the attitude song, because he was insistent. Uh, if you're going to bend along with him, you have to bend at precisely the same rate and for at precisely the same distance and then release at the same time. So all that stuff got, got very micro organized in a way that I hadn't experienced with any other player. And then there was just coming to terms with the unfairness of it because his fingers are so much longer than mine. And then, and then having to play that stuff with him required a lot of sort of mind over matter techniques. So it was huge. Plus we're both from Long Island. We both went through the, the Zappa uh, experience. We always had a lot in common, a lot to talk about. Very good hang on the bus. It was, a, it, that was a great band. I love that band. Yeah. And, and I, I've read so many stories with you about the Zappa thing. And I think the biggest urban legend being you're in the backseat of a car, learning a bunch of songs to get to rehearsal. <laughs> That's actually true, which is unlike most urban legends. Cause you know, I've, I've heard a bunch of outlandish stuff about that, that first audition, but I, I, yeah, I was in, in the back of, of the car with my brother driving from San Diego to LA while I was trying to practice every Zappa song, which you, you can't fit the whole repertoire into a two and a half hour car ride, but I was trying. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. You nice. know, guys, I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to work through um, those that have um, actually paid for this session, but I'm, I'm very unsuccessful. So I'm just going to bring the next person in. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Joshua, I'm going to put you on screen. Do you want to ask oh, hello. Mike? Do you want to ask Joshua something? Joshua, what are you doing? What's going on? What 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 kind of music is keeping you occupied, and are you happy? I'm very happy because I just got my first clients for some production stuff, and I'm actually recording a EP for my uh, church actually. Excellent. Yep. Great. Awesome stuff. I'm going to pick up the pace and remove you and Joshua. Uh, sorry, I muted Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, ask Alex something. I actually paid Alec, uh, for Alex's class so I can ask him all I want later. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> we can move on. Let's not waste time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, great to see you, Alex. Hey, ask, hola. Ask Sammy something. Uh, Sammy, what hobbies do you have? Okay, I have this hobby, and um, and um, then. Uh, I'm now in Lapland in Finland, so skiing. We have just cut the, some skis, so ice skiing, snowboarding, and nice. slalom. Nice, nice. Uh, I'm from Austria originally, but I'm one of the worst skiers, I have to tell you that. <laughs> I actually broke my collarbone once when I the last, last run from the lift. I went down, it was foggy. I fell and then I and I skied down with a broken collarbone. That's how tough I was. <laughs> you have to skip anyway. the last run, Alex. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, I know now. <laughs> now I know. And now you play ping pong. No, well, it's closed because of the pandemic. But Ola, I picked up bike riding. Oh, Seriously. Awesome. Serious bike riding. And I want to talk to you about uh, maybe, you know, some gear that we can, we need cleats for pedals, <laughs> uh, but, but for, for effect pedals and, and maybe a Dura Ace tremolo. Yes, I know yeah. everything about bikes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm catching up, but you're a gravel rider, right? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm on the road, but, but yeah, who knows? There might yeah. be a time. It's good enough. All right. Thank you. Kick, Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna kick you out. Okay. Sammy, uh, sorry, not not Alan. You've already been on. 
um, ask Kurt something. Hi, Kurt. How's it going? Cool, cool. Um, so, um, what uh, what's on going on your playing side nowadays? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm very amateur. I've probably spent like the last two weeks trying to learn Heart by Pliny. Um, I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying on camera. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of that, aside from that, for like listening, I've been listening to the new Intervals album. I know Pliny's new album comes out in a couple days and uh, listening to a lot of In Flames lately. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Great stuff. I am adding Jack in. Kurt, ask Jack something. Uh, <coughs> wow. <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay. Um, can I make it a two part question? Is that all right? Go for it. Okay, awesome. Um, when you were first learning guitar, um, were you mostly self taught or did you have anybody sort of guiding you along the way? Um, I had classical guitar lessons in school, um, sec um, secondary school, which is, I guess, high school in the US. Um, so I had a little bit of guidance in that sense. And then I was taught by a guy called John Wheatcroft, who was the head of Guitar X in London. I, don't, I think that's the equivalent of like Musicians Institute in LA. I had him for one year. And then really after that year, so when I was 11, um, after he left, sorry, I think maybe I was like self-taught for like five years until I met Tom Quayle and then that's when, yeah, Tom gave okay. me the kind of guidance to move on then, yeah. Okay. In the time that you were more or less self-teaching to improve on what you'd already learned, um, what was one of the more technical sides of guitar that you struggled with? And when you didn't have anybody else more or less to guide you, what was your most effective approach into overcoming it? Oh, wow, good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and keep this short, but like <laughs> I think um, the biggest thing really is when you're younger, you, you're not really, well, I mean, at least for me, I wasn't massively into the improvisation side of things. I appreciated it and I like loved to listen to it, but I had no idea where to begin. You know, we all start with like a pentatonic scale and things like this. Um, so really, that was probably the hardest thing is trying to teach yourself the harmony and the theory and then when i met tom that was the moment when it was like the first lesson the light bulb went on you know and you you realize how little you actually know even if you feel like you can play and you know you've been playing for five or so years yeah tom totally flipped that on its head and opened up all the doors i think i only had like maybe five or six lessons with him but that was all it took really to to kind of spark the flame shall we say awesome awesome great answer it is and Thanks, dude. There's so many of you here. Jack, ask Gustavo something. Gustavo, how you doing, man? Hey, Jack. <laughs> good to see you, dude. dude. Um, Gustavo, okay, so how did you get into the crazy hybrid picking stuff that you do? Crazy? No, <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> no, man. <laughs> yeah, where did the inspiration come from? Uh, well, that, that's easy to 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 respond. I my undergrad was actually a conservatory. I went to a conservatory in Brazil to study classical guitar. So at the same time that I had to maintain a repertoire, like all those things. I mean, you study classical guitar, like Villa Lobos, all the Bach transcriptions, uh, and more contemporary stuff. I was playing this prog rock metal band. So it was like at the same time that I was studying uh, electric guitar and classical guitar in college, I, I was never good at like holding the pick and hiding the pick or like biting the pick. I would do messy stuff. So I started like trying to do my classical stuff on electric guitar and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's how I uh, naturally, not naturally, it took me eight years to develop this. Yeah. And I started like teaching some, some, some of those things. And some of my students said, oh, why don't you write more stuff in that style? And, and I met Wayne Krantz first time I went to New York. So 97, and I ended up studying with Wayne for seven months. 
and also I saw that guy Brad Garst from Australia. So so I saw those guys. Those were my huge inspirations. And then I started just writing my own exercises stuff for myself and uh, and and still suck at it. But uh, I'll, I'll get there. Don't be silly, man! It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome, fantastic. Good one. Gustavo, ask Becca something. Becca, hey. great to see you. It's been a long yeah. time. I know, good to see you too. Hi, Becca. How's everything? Good. How are you? Great. No complaints. So, awesome. is that your question? Yes. <laughs> I ask. I ask Becca a question now, right? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, Becca. Uh, out of all the elements of music that you that you practice, you dedicate yourself. What's the hardest element in, like, in terms of technique or like harmony, rhythm, uh, melody, improvisation? What is the hardest for you that you're still struggling with? And, and I know you're an amazing guitarist, professional. Thank you. Just like what what still hits the wall there? I feel like if I don't keep doing it every once in a while, five string or more sweeps, I'll start to trip on them for whatever reason. And I've been practicing them for a really long time. And like, I'm good at them most of the time, but there's certain patterns that if I just don't keep doing it, my fingers just slowly start to lose it. And it's my right hand. It's not my left hand most of the time. Okay. Well. But. Have you ever tried the, the Gambale method? I mean, yeah, a little bit. I yeah. know some of his sweet patterns. Those are really fun. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff there. And sometimes yeah. it changes direction in the middle too, which is really cool. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Vincent, you're on. Rebecca, ask Vincent something. Um, okay, let's see. Okay. Um, what is, I like these technique questions we've been doing. Um, have you explored music theory at all? And like, how big of a part do you find it plays into your actual playing? Um, well, uh, not enough. Uh, I started out on piano and I just kind of treated it as kind of a chore mm. uh, and just tried to do as little of it as possible. Totally um, fair. <laughs> yeah, but you know, um, I was a bit more classically trained in the sense of like uh, playing piano or saxophone or something, reading sheet yeah. music. But now uh, I'm learning guitar just about a year in and I want to dive into like music theory and like composition and, and all that stuff is as much as possible. So learning different modes and stuff. Um, uh, I wanted to make, uh, I want to make it a much bigger part of my whole music uh, experience and, and, and learning like journey. Nice. Awesome. Thanks. You I, think, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it totally does. <laughs> Thanks. Vincent, ask the amazing Adam Rafowitz something. I don't know about amazing, but what's up, Vincent? <laughs> hey, how's it going, Adam? Good, good, good to meet you, man. Cool. Um, what is your favorite uh, finish on like, uh, um, well, most guitars seem to be made out of wood. So what's your favorite like visual finish um, and like pattern, stain, things like that? Yeah, just my favorite like look of a guitar essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say my my custom seven here with the spalted maple top. I don't know if that's gonna focus Ooh. right, but that's like, oh, I just love this guitar. It looks like it was ripped out of the ground, you know? just all natural. And that's really what I was going for. Um, I actually have a spalted maple carving I got as well. But then once I got my first Strandberg, I kind of haven't really played it. But yeah, I would I would say that. And then uh, I really do like the flame on the sail in here. I mean, it's, it's just a gorgeous finish, you know, classic, but with a modern twist. 
It depends yeah. on the guitar too. You know, I'm not a huge fan of glossy finishes generally, but you know, on some body styles, I think it works really nicely. Like a PRS, for example, with a matte finish just doesn't look right to me. I don't know. Anyway, it's my long winded uh, response. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. So Adam, ask Ali something. All right, Ali. Um, let's see. What inspires you to write music? What helps inspire you and what helps re-inspire you when you are finding yourself in a period of writer's block? Right now, uh, most of the time it's other people's music, but uh, in when the quarantine began, I started to watch films like art mm -hmm. films and those stuff inspire me so much, especially if the soundtrack is good too. Like it's a whole other universe for me to find inspiration. Absolutely. Yeah, it can really help set the, uh, it makes you feel different things while seeing a movie, you know, it can change everything. Cool. Awesome, thank you. Ali, ask Richard something. Wow, big fan, first of all. Hello, how you doing? Hi. Uh, I know, uh, when you first started guitar, uh, what was your vision? Have you thought, like, when you come this far? Yeah, I mean, I actually started off on the piano first. So I guess when I went to guitar, I was basically trying to transfer all of that information onto the guitar. So it's hard to really know because I was quite young when I started playing guitar. So I was just trying to play like Beatles covers and like Radiohead songs and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think I was just initially trying to transfer all of the theory that I learned on the piano onto the guitar and just see where that took me really. And uh, yeah, it's just been a long, long road, but this is where we are now, so. That's brilliant. So Richard, ask Sam something. Um, where's Sam? Hello, Sam. I don't feel like I can see you. There's so many, so many faces here. <laughs> um, aside from playing guitar, during the lockdown, what have you been up to? Have you got any hobbies that you've been doing? How you've been keeping busy? Um, oh, there you are. I can see you. I've been trying to catch up on reading, to be quite honest. Um, I'm not, I'm not much of like a hobby guy. Like I kind of just like eat, sleep, play music. Uh, but I've, but I've been trying to actually like, you know, like uh, there's that whole analogy of like, you know, you can give your brain like candy or you can give it healthy food. And I think of candy as being like, you know, TV and dumb YouTube videos, which I was previously addicted to. So now this is my excuse to actually read. Like I was, I was reading David Burns book just earlier today, how music works. Um, Oh. And I also just finished uh, The Mysterious Stranger, which is the last thing that Mark Twain ever wrote. So that's what I've been doing in the lockdown. Very cool. Yeah, I love to read too. I just finished um, The Road. Have you read oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, Cormac man. McCarthy, I believe. Yeah, it was harrow harrowing stuff. <laughs> I was in bed like last night and it was like midnight. I just finished the story and it was like the most brutal ending to a book. I was like, oh man, this is too much. I, I can't sleep. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read Stephen King next. I'm a big big oh, fan. Well, of yeah. Stephen King. <laughs> but yeah, I love nice. to read too. That's cool. Great. Awesome. Good stuff. Uh, so Sam, ask Demon Player Pohawk something. Hello, oh, Sam. Man. It's been a while. We yeah. Used to, um, he used to take lessons from me. In oh no, yep. you know each other. Back. We know yeah. each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what um. Well, well, Poe, since I, since I know you a bit already, I know you have a really diverse range of influences. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering like, what, like, what is the thing that like informs your, your writing and your playing that you think would be the biggest surprise to, to like me and your other listeners? Um, could you repeat that question one more time? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, 
Yeah. It just I, I know from from studying with you that you have like a diverse range of influences from like jazz, metal and classical and all that. So I'm wondering, like, what you think from your own set of influences would be the biggest surprise to somebody who listens to you? Hmm. Uh, that's that's a good question. I, I don't really know. Maybe uh, I really like um, Indian music. So I try to use Hell that yeah. a lot. And um, but it's a really difficult style of music that I'm still learning. So I guess mm-hmm. you could say that. Yeah. Right on. Right on. All right. Cool. We're bringing. Is is German your name? Uh, Pohawk, yeah. ask German something. Yeah. Can, can you hear me now? It's so good. Yeah. Hey, German. How's it going? Hello. How's it going? Um, OK, so my question for you is, do you have a ritual before writing music? Not, not really. I, I don't, I don't really write a lot of music. I don't find myself writing a lot of music at the moment. So I'm pretty much just playing uh, different, you know, different songs, different, different things that I like. But uh, yeah, well, I guess uh, when I do write music, I just, it just happens. Yeah, there's no no specific ritual or anything, anything like that. It just literally happens. It can be, you know, I can just say an entire day and just work. Uh, you know, work on writing music, and then suddenly it can be gone. Yeah, and I just gotta wait till it comes back. <laughs> yeah, I know what yeah. you mean. Yeah. Right. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Well, German, ask math rock extraordinaire player Brock Benzel something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know what's the fa- what's what's your your favorite guitar of the ones that you that you own, and uh, why? And would you mind uh, showing the guitar to us? Yeah, sure. Um, or maybe have any stories or. I don't know. So my favorite one at the moment is actually the first one that I got, which is this. Um, you know, it's the Bowden OS Seven. Um, it was you know. I kind of went in blind. <laughs> I sort of I knew I was into the I was into Stramberg, but I had never really spent any time with one. So I kind of I just went for it. I, I saved up for it. I went for it. And you know, it showed up and it was just like, this just feels right. This feels like the best guitar. And so I had never played a seven string before. And yeah. I had never played a guitar with fan frets and I had never played a headless guitar. I had like it was completely new to me. And so I'm always looking to just like throw myself off the deep end, you know, and just like do something completely different do something completely new. And so I just sort of got to build like a connection to this guitar sort of from scratch. Um, I had to relearn everything I knew how to do because it just felt a lot different um, Mm -hmm. to my Mm -hmm. like six string brain, you know? Um, And as a result, it, you know, I came up with all these different, these different ways of writing and now it's like I write all these seven string riffs. I write all these kind of different tuning riffs and different kind of techniques and things. And it kind of, I don't know, it, it almost feels like um, it was the fuel to push me forward to kind of to kind of do it all together, you know. Um, I've also probably traveled the most with this guitar. Um, you know, I I would always bring it on tour, and I still always bring it on tour um, for one of my bands. And you know, it's been all my favorite places, and it's played all my favorite songs. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, yeah, uh, check it out. Is, is that a bolt on guitar? Yeah, 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 it's yeah, it's it's um, you know, one of the OS sevens. Uh, sorry, let me move back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm a you know, I'm a sucker for that just like clean, natural flame maple top. Um, it just looks. I don't know. I think when I was younger, I, I saw a guitar player play a guitar with a flame maple top that just looked really natural. It was really really good and i was like that's what the good guitar players play i gotta get one of those you know? <laughs> um, all right, yeah. all right. Guitar. awesome stuff so brock ask alon something our uh hey how are you doing hey how's it going uh okay so my question for you is i want you to tell me about the last record you listened to that blew your mind oh wow um uh... Oh, okay. Okay. I think I got it. There's this, um, 
I don't know how to categorize it, but there's this band from the U.S. that's called Elder. I think they're from the U.S. They might be from Canada, but I think it's the U.S. They're called Elder. They they just released uh, an album that's called Omen. It's kind of like stoner rock meets 70s progressive music, and I like it. It's just like it's like progressive, but mm, I don't know, like atmospheric and ethereal and and just monotonous, but in, in a good way, kind of like Pink Floyd. And I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. So that's my name. That's my answer. Cool. That's awesome. Who is next? Let's bring Rissard up. So Alon, ask Rissard something. Hey, Rissard. Wow, what a cool t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see. Let me think again. I, I just I'll need just two seconds. Okay. Um, uh, what's the last thing you've been practicing? Like um, the last thing on your mind that you're like just trying to get better at? Um, <clears throat> good question. I mean, it's it's. It's going to be just sort of technique stuff. Unfortunately, well, it's it's going to be technique stuff. Like before we had our lockdown, um, I was at the gym and I slammed my finger in between two weights. Oh man! Yeah, it took me back. Um, <laughs> That's a bad a day. Of weeks and it literally just um, got better like this week. So I'm sort of just getting back into practicing kind of everything. I did do a little bit slowly, but man I, I thought it was broken or maybe fractured but i think it was just heavily bruised but yeah it was it was it was pretty it hurt a lot but anyway to answer your question um yeah i mean it's it's just kind of going back over the technique stuff just to kind of wake up those fingers you know wake like up my regain brain. strength yeah pretty much and just kind of mm -hmm. doing the basic stuff like all you guys probably do just kind of looking at your arpeggios and and sort of just maybe jazz chords or something, you know, just to kind of build that strength up again. Um, all right, yeah. man, I really, I wish you all the best, <laughs> really. You too. Uh, speed recovery. Thank you. Thanks, Rissard. Good to well, see you, by the way. You too. Ask Zion something. Hey, Zion, how's it going? Pretty good, how about yourself? I'm great, I'm fab. I've got a good question for you. Um, What's the most embarrassing gig experience you've had? Oh, that's a good one. And I have an answer already ready because no. I'll, I'll never forget this one. So <laughs> I was standing on this right side, stage right, and I was walking over towards the middle of the stage and I was noticing my levels coming down. So I was, while playing, I'm just subtly like signaling to sound just like go up. And it's going up, but I find it's keeps going down as, as I'm walking and, you know, it's coming through the monitors, no matter what monitor I'm in front, I hear it. And then I hear my friend waving from the side of the stage, like your cables gone under your volume pedal and it's pulling it up as you're moving. So I was like, oh no, I run back, step on the volume pedal. But at this point, the tech has raised my sound so much. So the next note that played was just like, a... and I, I remember that one, it was, 15 years ago, I, I remember it very well. Did you, did you get invoiced for a new PA system? <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's a good story. That's funny. <laughs> All right, cool stuff. Let's bring Todd up here. Uh, Cyan, ask Todd something. Hey, Todd, how's it going? Hey, doing all right. Todd, what are some of some pieces of music, whether it's a part or a song itself, that give you goosebumps? Oh man, so that can, that is a pretty wide range. I think um, I would say anything from uh, some of uh, Glenn Gould's interpretations of Bach uh, to um, some of the stuff on Pliny's new albums. Um, just well thought out and 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 very cathartic um so yeah it's a pretty wide range occasionally even i um write something that that also moves me too and i, I think we all experience that at different times um 
Yeah, so I, I think that's the function. The pri- one of the primary functions of music, right, is, is to move us in some way. Really good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find who I haven't talked to. Gerard, let's uh, Todd ask um, Gerard something. Um, yeah, so uh, kind of related to pandemic stuff. Uh, I, I was wondering um, what you're turning to outside of music um, during the pandemic um, to occupy time uh you know whether it's reading or, or or podcasts or something that you've discovered uh over the last you know six to nine months that um has helped you get by through this period jerry we, we can't hear you oh that okay he there says we go my apologies, everybody. Um, through the pandemic, honestly, uh, spending a lot of time with family um, at home, we're all at home, and I have my grandkids staying here with me, so they've been a lot of fun. You know, being able to to spend a lot of time with them. They're they're little, one and three years old, and um, and other than that, besides playing and studying music. Um, racing I love Formula One so I've been able to spend a little time getting into that series um, but it's mostly been music because it's been what I've been doing uh, most of my my whole life 50 years of playing uh, so it's kind of hard to to set it aside the pandemic didn't really change that I've always really been into it so that's that's uh, awesome sorry. nice very, very nice Thanks. Very cool. So let's let, let's do an experiment. Um, I'm removing this thing called Spotlight, and let's let's everyone switch to Gallery View in the Zoom client, and then we can all see each other. Somewhere that they're supposed to be command to hide non-video. But I don't know how to. So whoever wants to ask a question, unmute and um, ask whoever is on the screen what you're burning to ask. Hello, can I ask a question? Go for it, Andre. Thank you very much. Hello from Romania. I would like to ask Richard Henshaw a question. Is there any specific element in nature that always inspires you to create music? Ah, oh, wow. That's a tough one. Well, we've, we've got an album called The Mountain. So maybe I'll go for mountains. Although our first album, Aquarius, um, was actually inspired by the water cycle. So uh, we had the concept kind of mapped out before I started on the music. And then I actually kind of based some of the ideas on the names of the songs. And one of the songs was called Eternal Rain. So I kind of wrote a guitar part that was trying to almost emulate the sound of rain cascading. So yeah, I'll go for, go for water or just the water cycle in general. Good question. Thank, thank you very much. Side note, I freaking love the mountain. Great album. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, man. Yeah. Oh, big, big fan of your guitar playing too. And your new album, that's you. awesome. Oh, really, thanks, man. Appreciate really, that. really good stuff. Just crazy how you write that stuff. Yeah, I blame a lot of that on Joey for sure, our keyboardist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how do you play it as well? <laughs> it must be tricky trying to play Lots that stuff live. It's so uh, it, kind of well put together. Have you played any of that stuff yet? The new album? Um, the the like EP or uh, oh, the EP. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we haven't played it live, you know, but we uh, we have filmed a couple of videos, so I guess yeah, we've uh, we've played it. And I will say, like, at least my parts on this EP are a lot 
easier overall than like our second album. Some of the songs on that album were just like brutal. But you know, got to be able to play it live. So that's, that's uh, that, yeah, that's the thing. You kind of write stuff, but then you think, actually, I've got to go and play this in front of loads of people. I and know. Then the adrenaline kicks in and it totally affects the way you play. So you got to, yeah, you got to take it into account. Especially if it's like an incredibly technical, brutal, exhausting song, but it's like fifth in the set. Well, you got to like make sure you're warmed up enough for it, yeah. but not exhausted. So exactly. it's kind of like we, we have to keep that in mind when putting together a set list. I'm sure you do as well. God, yeah. I mean, yeah, I buckle a lot, a lot of the time. So yeah, I think we put the most technical songs towards the end of the set and mm -hmm. just start with the ballads or whatever. Yeah, yeah, we generally start with a song that's like pretty easy, um, at least relatively speaking, and then kind of work our way up. Maybe have a little break, you know, in the middle, depending on the set length. You play much longer sets than uh, Arch Echo generally has, I would say. Yeah, we need to cut down on that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate uh, the kind words. Yeah. All right. Next question. Go for it. Mind if I go? Oh, shoot. Great. Um, Adam, this would be for you again, if that's all right. How could you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> typically, um, from what I've seen a lot of people say in interviews, when they've switched from a previous guitar over to Strandberg uh, that first time, um, is that you can be a little bit apprehensive to it, obviously, where it's such a unique uniquely designed guitar specifically the neck um where you're such a dynamic and technical guitar player in your style what was it about suddenly switching to such a specifically ergonomic instrument that made you more or less rely on that in comparison to whatever instrument it was you were using primarily before sure um so i, I guess i wouldn't say like i couldn't pull it off on a, a less ergonomic guitar although it may be more difficult um, I will say the first time I picked up a Strandberg, uh, it was just like, it's so light. This one especially is like the lightest one I have. It was just comfortable to sit with and play for an extended period of time. I think that's, uh, where a lot of the advantages lie for me. Just the comfort allow you to, allows you to just play for a longer amount of time, uh, without, I guess, wearing yourself down. Um. But it felt very natural to me when I first picked it up. Obviously, it felt it felt like different. It felt very different just because of the, you know, the Endurnak and all that. But it it felt different, but comfortable at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. More or less, yeah. Um, it's a... Uh... See, I, I just had this conversation in the uh, previous uh, segment online, and uh, again, just where it's kind of hard in certain areas of the world to actually try the guitar. Um, sure. Yeah, like being able to kind of get the concept of like, how is this going to be different? Um, it's a little bit weird, you know, looking into the purchase of it, but like, honestly, on the testimony of everyone who's played one, I'm like, if I had the money, I'd be very yeah. it. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh... Ola, let me know if this still is a thing. The Strandberg Finder, where you can like register if you have a guitar um is that still no in no when um the the gdpr the european stupid legislation where you can't store personal data uh when when uh, that hit we kind of just said forget it <laughs> okay because yeah that was a great program i actually met up with a couple of different people um yeah. who i'm like still friends with and they both ended up buying a strandberg in the end but you know this was a uh, a time when like the os i have is like the prototype of all the production guitars, so you couldn't really find somebody that had a Strandberg unless they had a custom or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that no, was a cool. Uh, program, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll find some some solution to, to do the equivalent thing. But for for those of you that that don't know, uh, basically you you could appear on in the Strandberg Finder, and then you could you could go in there and search for other players and, and get in touch with them and and meet up. To, to try their Strandberg. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my other inbox was quite inundated when that happened because I was <laughs> one of the very, very early players. And I checked my other inbox and wow, I had a lot of messages. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, there were there weren't a lot of Strandbergs out there when when you started playing. Uh, almost nine years. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. All right, who's next? I'd like to ask a question for any of you that have a signature model. What made you decide on the neck material? Um, this one is uh, maple and my prog is ebony. I actually like the ebony better myself. So I'm just curious, what made you decide on the neck you chose for your signature model? Uh, I guess Alex, you, you're the closest. Yeah, um, I'm an idiot when it comes to wood. So uh, there was no, Ed Yoon actually suggested the, the types of woods and said, this is pretty close. And then I got a prototype, I loved it. And that was that. <laughs> so it's a very unscientific <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, sorry, I, there is no, there is nothing more behind that. And I, I'd like on, to give. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, sir, or a reply at least. <laughs> um, I don't have a signature, but I've had many Strandbergs go through my hands over the years, and there's things I like about each different wood material. Rosewood seems to be a little bit warmer. Um, maple has more of like a sweet note uh, you can find in like uh, like the upper registers. But ebony, I really like because it's tight and articulate. And some people like it because it's almost too bright. But that tight grain really lends itself to very percussive rhythm playing, at least in my opinion. I, I want to say one more thing about that. I, I think uh, if you have any good guitar, I mean, you will instantly adapt. And, and even if there are some brighter or darker woods or whatever, I mean, we adapt so quickly and then we adjust the settings on the amp. So of course we can search for the perfect wood combination eternally. On the other hand, uh, I think that the, uh, the instrument has just to resonate with you in general, and then you will basically adjust and get your sound anyway, to a certain point, of course, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know. And I think, I mean, they, they, they feel different when you play them. Uh, they'll, the, the touch will feel different on each of these fretboard materials. So I, I think that that tactile part of playing uh, beyond what it actually sounds like, but what, what it feels like to play, uh, I, I do think that's a, a major um, deciding factor. And then you can shape the sound downstream. And I would say maple, ebony, rosewood, they feel distinctly different against your fingers. I agree. Adam, you've, you've had uh, uh, custom guitars made. How, how did you choose the fretboard material? Um, well, on this one, it's actually, how do you say it? Is it zero coat or zero cote? Uh, either, either one. OK. Well, I've always thought that's just like the grain in zero cote or zero coat is just so interesting. It almost looks like a mountain range, you know, and uh, from what I read, it was fairly similar to ebony, but maybe a little more porous. Correct me if I'm wrong. At all. It, it feels similar to ebony to me, at least. Um, and, you know, I, I totally agree that, um, you know, I don't really care what fretboard wood it is. It just has to feel good on the guitar overall. And yeah, you adjust your settings. Um, I'd say the biggest choices were, you know, the, the roasted maple. This neck is very stable. Um, and yeah, got to roast it. And then the, uh, the limba, the black limba has a great balanced tone. Um, I wanted a guitar with a little more beef than maybe uh, the, the swamp ash, like just a little more weight. So I really like that... Uh, aspect that the limba brings to it and this vaulted maple you know just looks cool <laughs> yeah yeah it's yeah okay any more questions from anywhere oh can i can ask you a question uh, uh, yeah no. okay i wanted to know do you have any like crazy ideas regarding instrument building, which are not 
fully fleshed out yet, but which you might want to share? Um, no. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> no, um, um, crazy ideas. No, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's, um, it gets weird when, when you, or when, when I started out and, uh, and it was just me in my garage and I had no aspirations other than building myself a guitar and, and, and just get my mind off things. Um, obviously my thought process was freer than it is now when we're an actual company with a lot of people uh, getting their paycheck that puts food on their table from us. So, I mean, you, you become much more risk averse, um, unfortunately. And um, there's ideas, definitely. And, and there's um, some, some things have taken a long time to bring to market, not because they weren't thought out, but because we kind of intentionally had to, um, to, to postpone. So it's, it's, it's a decision-making process that, that goes way beyond if it's fun or, or cool. So that's, that's a very boring answer, but <laughs> there's, there's, there's ideas and I'm, I'm sure we'll have some cool stuff coming out eventually. Okay, looking forward to seeing this, thank you. Me too. Hey, Ola, can I ask you a question? Yeah. <clears throat> So Peter already answered this on the on the other uh, uh, meeting, but my question to you: Do you think you ever do uh, the left-handed models as a mass pro or a consistent production rather than a run, like where we would have access to, you know, buying it whenever? Yeah, I uh, I I think the the odds are good for that, but uh, then <laughs> it's a matter of of when. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't hear the the discussion with uh, with Peter, but um, at, at the moment our struggle is is to um, increase production capacity but maintain like quality, which which is what what is really holding us back. And and we can't meet demand of of the already established models with the the existing production volume that that we have, and throwing something completely new into manufacturing uh, like a left-handed model has implications beyond just now we reserve 100 pieces capacity uh, it, it it messes up so many other things so um the the boring answer is that uh, we have to really right now focus our, our priorities um but Leftists were on the roadmap for for this year. Um, it, it's it's just uh, it everything's been pushed. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, though. Yeah, it's I feel bad, but we'll get them. We we get so many questions about lefties. Um, so I, I I actually have a funny story if I may share about eight nine years ago. We were having the same. Uh, um, uh, I guess. Lefties, you know, we don't have a lot of variety out there, but we would, I would always be hanging out in the, in the Ernie Ball Music Man uh, forum. And after just bugging Ern, uh, Sterling Ball, he was actually, he was actually able to make a few uh, JP runs. And I have one of the first uh, John, uh, John Petrucci left-handed guitars, which is, I've always thought it was cool. So I'm hoping one day I could be one of the first, uh, Owners, I know there's a few of us that are well, a few lefties out there that own Strandbergs, but I like to be one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I hope to get there soon. Thank you all. I appreciate it. You bet. Any more questions? Yeah, can I ask a question to Jack? Yeah, uh, my question was uh, first of all, I love your YouTube channel and uh, what do you think about a uh, YouTube as a platform for guitar players, and what can it do? Uh, what can us uh, younger musicians better you to do to better utilize the platform? 
Oh man, I think it's just all about consistency. Um, if you were following my channel, I think I took a break for like three years or something like this. And then with the start of lockdown, that was when I was kind of like, how can I give back in some way? And I know everyone was obviously sat at home. So the free lessons on a Friday thing, um, it kind of pushed me to be honest, because there was weeks where I couldn't be bothered, but I thought, no, I'm going to do this until we finally come out. So I think it's just, it's finding what you like and having something to share, whether that's just your playing, whether that's your ideas, your compositions, or whether that's your teaching, whether that's your thoughts on playing guitar, find something that you'd like to do and talk about it. I think that's the beauty of it, really, you know. Um, do whatever you want to do on there, but just remember the consistency is probably the key if you want to build up like a community or if you want to make it a part of your living. I think just doing it regularly, even if it's not perfect all the time, um, it's just so that people know that you're there, I guess. I guess that's the best I can answer that question. Hey, thank you so much. No problem, man. Well, we have three minutes left on the official clock. Mike, let, let me ask you, how, how did you come up with the idea for your pickup demo video? Because that was very cool. Is that online yet? I, I believe so. Okay, cool. Um, well, I just, I had seen Alex's and I was really daunted by it because it was, it's, it was brilliant, you know, just like everything he does. And uh, <laughs> so I thought, what can I do? You know, uh, and, and I just, the idea of the video was, was to, uh, demonstrate the pickups. And I thought that the, just the, the best approach to take was to write something for five guitar parts, each one, you know, with a, a different pickup position which uh, led to certain ways of approaching tones and rhythm parts and melodies and stuff. And it all, I was happy the way that it all kind of wove together nicely. And it's going to because it's one instrument, but it really, at the same time that it all sounds coherent and cohesive because it's all the same guitar, there's a lot of tonal variation as well. And that's that's what I wanted to display there. And it, it made it, even though it was, it was, you know, it took a long time to do, all the musical choices came real quick because the guitar was just sort of giving them to me. So it was fun to do. It's great. Yeah, very cool. I mean, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to uh, be working with, with all of you um, artist guys and, and hanging with you um, Strandberg family people on this, uh, on this meeting right now. Um, so one last question. There's two minutes on the clock. I have one one question. Yeah, go. Actually, two questions, but they're very quick. <laughs> one is for you, Ola. I was wondering, because there are a lot of people in the chat that wanted an answer for this question. Is there any plan for extending uh, the new pickups to the seven and eight strings models? Yeah, eventually. Uh, definitely. Uh, again, we're we're at the um, just as with the guitar, we, we just have to have laser focus on on um, on our priorities. Uh, but definitely, we we do aim to uh, start looking into seven and eight strings uh, at some point. I, I I don't know when, but yeah. Thank you. And my second question goes to Richard again, which is uh, what was your last known breakthrough moments on the guitar like that moment when you said oh man this is so nice playing your own stuff actually what you know that moment when you got happy playing guitar really happy uh, well i'm still waiting for that breakthrough moment <laughs> still haven't had it yet um i think one of the most fun things i've done is probably you know the piano style tapping on the guitar. I kind of mentioned it earlier, but uh, yeah, I really enjoy that. You can kind of open up new doors by exploring that technique and you end up coming out with ideas that you wouldn't necessarily have come out with by playing in a kind of more ordinary fashion. So yeah, that was, I still haven't really mastered it, but um, back in the day when I was exploring it further, that was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Cheers. All right, very cool, everyone. Um, we we actually don't have another session back to back. The, the next se session is is Alex masterclass in an hour. Uh, but I'm gonna wrap up anyway. Um, do you 
let's just do this one last thing. Everyone that has a guitar handy, uh, get it. And let's just hold it up to the camera and then we can do a screenshot thing. I'm going to run and get one too. All right, you're looking awesome. Yay, Strandberg. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, I hope you enjoyed hanging with us um, this past hour. And um, keep checking in the remaining uh, StrandCon um, presentations um, today and, and tomorrow. And uh, yeah, signing off. Take care. Always guys. a pleasure, guys. Thanks for having yeah. me. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. See all. Bye bye. Bye. Hola, sorry to disturb you, but if you want to stop your recording now, I think you could because it might take up a huge amount of savings storage space on your computer later on and it'll probably be easier to uh,